It may be odd to be talking to an evolution biologist about economics, but uh, I don't see a difference between the two. For one thing, the words ecology and economy come from ancient Greek roots, and ecology is the ecos, household, uh, and so is economy a household. They both come from the word ecos, but economy is the ecos nomos, which means the law or rule of the household. And ecology is the ecos logos, and that's the organization of the household. And why would you separate the structure of the household, the organization of the household, from the way it is run, the rule of the household? So I pointed that out once in one of Clinton's uh, meetings on sustainability because they had spent the whole morning talking about why should we talk about ecology in, um, or economy, why should we talk about economy when this is a meeting about, I said it again wrong, why should we be talking about ecology when this is about economics? Okay. Um, Anyway, the real reason that uh, I, as an evolution biologist, uh, have gotten myself involved with economics is because, as far as I know, economics is about the acquisition and transformation of resources into useful items, and then the distribution and the consumption and either the throwing away or the recycling of those things. Now, in nature, it's always a case of recycling because nature has a zero-waste economy. It's a closed-loop economy where the recycling is necessary to keep a finite planet evolving endlessly new species and ecosystems and things from the same materials, basically. Okay, that's one piece <laughs> to breathe <laughs> and remember where I was going. <laughs> okay. um, so if we see that nature has billions of years of experience in this highly efficient and effective closed loop economy, then we really have something to learn from that since our economics have been linear economics where nature has been treated not as an ecosystem in which we're included, but as an environment, an impersonal it, uh, separate from us, that has been taken to be a pile of resources for human use. And then what we do is we take those resources, and in most cases they go through heat, beat, treat, uh, or our high-tech agriculture that's had a lot of heat, beat, treat methods behind it. And in that kind of production method, 96% of the resources are wasted to start with. And then, of the 4% that we turn into useful things, the, um, they're usually thrown into dumps afterwards. So we have 99 plus percent waste in our economy. And that's because we've never had a science of economics. We've never tried to learn economics from nature. Um, another thing that's very interesting to do is suppose you look at your body's economics. And my favorite way of telling this is to say, imagine that the uh, northern industrial organs are above the diaphragm and that they have the, the ownership of the rest of the body so that the raw material blood cells that form in bones all over the body can be mined and shipped to these northern industrial organs. And then the uh, heart-lung system gets into play and the lungs clean up the blood and um, oxygen is added to the blood and then the heart distribution center announces what the body price for blood is and you ship the blood only to those organs that can afford it. So you can see very quickly that this kind of an ownership and pricing system would not work very well in a healthy living system. In fact, some of those very bones that were mined, uh, if you think of them as the countries in which we do a lot of mining, might not be able to afford the finished product. So there's a lot to learn from nature about economics. So, if you want one more piece, I'll give you a cellular piece, okay? okay. <laughs> While we're well, on the subject. You're already getting my questions. <laughs> okay, all right. 
Inside every one of your cells, and you have up to a hundred trillion of them, the economy is about as complex as that of a large human city. Now, it's hard to really get this nano world complexity, but for example, each of your cells has about 30,000 recycling centers in it. And they are so high tech that they're equivalent of putting a dead tree into a chipper machine and getting a live tree out the other end. These recycling centers are there just to keep your proteins healthy. They pull in all the proteins that are either obsolete or damaged, and they take them apart amino acid by amino acid and put together a whole new molecule to uh, issue from the tube that is the recycling center. Now this is pretty amazing because Western science doesn't grant any intelligence at the cellular level. And yet, in my opinion, nature is intelligent from the get-go. And your cell knows exactly what's going on in its economy. Furthermore, each cell has about a thousand banks. I call the mitochondria, which were once ancient free-living bacteria that came together as part of the cooperative that built our kind of cells. Uh, these mitochondrial banks are night and day issuing what uh, Bernard Lietter would call stored value credit cards. These cards go out into the economy and are spent on every molecular transaction, every chemical process of the cell. Then when the credit line is spent, it goes back to the bank and a new credit line is put on it with no repayment demanded, much less interest charged. So night and day, your body is gifting free currency into an economy and the role of the banks, besides issuing the, the currency on the credit card, um, is to monitor the economy for how much currency needs to flow to perfectly balance it. So the credit line will go down if there's too much currency in the cell and will go up if more is needed there. It's a system that there's no reason humans can't copy. In Western science, which uh, has hegemony in the globe because every leading university all over the earth teaches Western science, the view of evolution comes from the Darwinian hypothesis, um, as everybody knows and has been taught. And in the Darwinian theory, uh, evolution happens through an endless kind of struggle for resources, a competition over resources. Now, in the Soviet Union, all the time that the capitalist West was teaching Darwin, the communist East was teaching Pyotr Kropotkin, whose uh, main book was Mutual Aid, and who taught the cooperative aspects of nature as the main evolution theory there. So there's been a lot of political involvement in evolution theory, if you think about it globally. And what was one of the great breakthroughs for me was recognizing that nature doesn't do either ors. It's profoundly conservative when things are going well and wildly radically creative when things don't work and it has to do new experiments and try out new forms and things. So also, um, it's, it's uh, not going to do only competition and or only cooperation. You know, the two balance each other again. There are many opposites that are inclusive in nature and that they're used appropriately. And the appropriate way to look at the competitive side of evolution theory and the cooperative side for me was to notice that scientists talk about type 1 and type 3 ecosystems primarily with type 2 as a mixture of the two. And in type 1 ecosystems, you have highly competitive species that are establishing themselves, that are bumping off their competition, that are being very creative and very hostile. And in type 3 ecosystems, you find that the ecology is tightly interwoven, a lot of mutual interdependency, a great deal of cooperation in them. And these are called type 3s or... Uh, climax ecosystems, while the type 1s are called pioneer. 
Now, the way I've told it, you probably see where I'm getting. There's a maturation curve going on here. There's a youthful phase that's creative and competitive, and there's a mature phase in which the competition becomes friendly and the cooperation dominates. So once I really got that, it was just a, a tremendous breakthrough for me to understand why we should be looking at the most mature versions of nature, those species or those ecosystems or those bodies that have the highest degree of evolution are the ones that are cooperative. Competition comes in as the dominant feature of the juvenile phase in evolution because a species has to spread itself over territory and get enough resources to multiply. That's its drive. And so it's bumping off the others that are trying to do this insofar as it can. At some point, it seems to be the case that species bumping into each other start to negotiate and develop some cooperative schemes that turn out to be more economically efficient cheaper in our terms, right, than killing your energy. It's cheaper to feed your enemy than to kill your enemy. So the mature form of cooperation maintains creativity by turning it into uh, a friendly competition like sports, like music comp competitions, like design competitions, the, where it's not about um, killing each other off, but about driving the best behavior or the best product. I'll tell you a little story. I was in China in 1974 at a basketball game. And when the first basket was made, the Chinese man next to me stood up and cheered and was very happy. The next basket was made by the other team. And again, he stood up and cheered and was happy. So I said, which is your team? And he said, I don't understand. I said, well, are you cheering for both teams? He said, I'm cheering for the, the points, the baskets. And I said, oh, in America we cheer, we choose one team and we want that team to win, so we only cheer for it. And he said, oh, well the point of having two teams play against each other is to drive excellence and we cheer the excellence. Now notice that the basketball game was identically played to ours, but the framing was different. The first half of Earth life was devoted entirely to bacteria. They were the only cells on the planet for almost two billion years. And they were feisty and competitive. They even got uh, so many technologies going, like developing motors uh, that the nanotech technicians are trying to copy now to invade each other, the smaller ones that were high-tech invading the larger sluggish ones, eating their resources from the inside, very much like colonialism or bacterial imperialism. And then eventually they went, started on this maturation cycle to develop cooperative schemes, different kinds of bacteria, which ended up as the nucleated cell, which is the only other kind of cell ever to develop on the planet. It's about a thousand times bigger than a bacterial cell, and it's made of lots of different kinds of formerly free-living ancient bacteria working together each having donated some of its DNA to the central library, the nucleus of the cell, and it's never had to be reinvented again. In evolution, there are only these two kinds of cells, the bacterial ones and the nucleated ones that we are made of. So then the, these nucleated cells had to go through a billion years of their own juvenile phase of competing with each other and multiple types of them and different ecosystems and all that. And then eventually they, in the next great leap in evolution, form the multi-celled creature. So now what I see happening in the world is globalization is our turn now to take our own species of lots of individuals and nations that have been in competition with each other and bring them together cooperatively as a global family. So we are seeing a situation now where there are more than a million NGOs, mostly grassroots, mostly trying to make life better for people at that level. We see uh, judges talking with judges over the internet and teachers with teachers and lots of cooperative alliances developing through those great conversations. 
For me as a biologist, the internet is the largest living system on the planet. It's not made of computers. It's made of people using computers to connect with each other. And um, it's a fabulous, fabulous resource that permits the cooperation to come in, whereas most people think of globalization just as multinationals taking over the world. The real globalization that's happening is the shift from those old hostilities to the new cooperative mature mode for humanity. When you look at evolution as a process of starting out with individual competition and then finding ways to cooperate, you can see that uh, the United States of America is a case of independent states having come together to form a union. The European Union is another one now. And during World War II, the oil companies realized that if they cooperated with each other, they were more powerful to exploit the rest of the world as a group, right? The resources and all that they could control together where they could no longer, con any one of them, get the monopoly. So these are in NATO, those alliances for security purposes or whatever, um, are all instances of moving into the cooperative age, but still being predominantly in the juvenile competitive, uh, me above everybody else kind of phase. So what we're seeing now is the multinationals have formed empires bigger than national empires, and that's just a continuation of the old empire-building mode from the actual emperors to the nation-states that developed their uh, empires, and now it's the uh, corporate empires. That's the representation of the trajectory of the youthful phase of our urbanized civilization. Many indigenous people got to the mature phase by themselves before we even developed all this urban world. Meanwhile, we see lots of instances of cooperation happening around the globe. For instance, there are more frequent world parliaments of religion and a great deal of interfaith dialogue. There are lots of exchanges among scientists and among sociologists and all kinds of people in conferences, great UN conferences on the great problems of the world. And um, there are also the internet that permits so much cooperative dialogue to go on. And we have an international space station now. And our communication systems went from one-to-one -one telephones to one-to-many broadcast, and now the many-to-many -many conversations are happening all over the world. So the cooperation is kicking in. And of course, those million NGOs are a big piece of it too. And the best way to understand this transition from the feisty competitive hostilities to the mature, friendly cooperation is through the metaphor of the butterfly. The caterpillar uh, consumes hundreds of times its weight in a single day before it's finally so bloated and has cut such a swath through its ecosystem without noticing the destruction that it hangs itself up and goes to sleep, basically, and its skin forms the hardened chrysalis. Inside that chrysalis, dormant, kind of uh, undifferentiated cells, so we'd call them stem cells, that have been hiding in the folds of the caterpillar's skin all along, begin to develop a whole new genome. And the, uh, the little cells, as they develop, start to link up with each other and become stronger, and the caterpillar's body starts to melt down into a nutritive soup for these butterfly cells to go on developing. And it is a different genome. It's as if long ago in evolution, some flippy flappy thing uh, was eaten by some creepy crawly thing and held on to the genome. And in early evolution, there's lots of this kind of mixing and matching. Apparently all the metamorphosing insects still carry these dual genomes that come out in sequence. So the competitive phase happened under the first genome and the cooperative phase under the second, which I love this as a metaphor because it means the future world is going to look very different. We're in huge crises and we get to reinvent everything now. We get to build that butterfly world, that living lightly on the earth instead of the heavy overconsumptive mode 
we can live a lifestyle everywhere that's appropriate to this planet that will keep the ecosystems healthy as it keeps us healthy. This is certainly the most exciting time to be alive in all human history. Um, and not the least of the excitement is due to huge crises. And this confluence of crises where you are hitting the, the end of the oil economy and you are seeing the planet warm up and your financial system is crashing on top of that is really, really frightening to most people because it's, uh, it seems so unprecedented. When you have a really evolutionary view and you know that nature always did its best creative work in crisis, and you remember that humans in really critical down-to-earth situations, whether it's fire or flood, tsunamis, uh, whatever, become instantly cooperative, then you know that it's not human nature only to compete with each other, as we've been told, but that humans are just as ready to roll up their sleeves and work together on things. And that the biggest crises have always produced the, the most wonderful cooperative behavior. I was in Kauai once, uh, not some years after they had been devastated by a hurricane that had broken every pane of glass on the whole island, uh, knocked out all the electricity, freezers full of food were thawing, and big parties happened instantly. They had to share that food that, that was in freezers. And they all started picking up the glass and cleaning up the uh, island. And 10 years later, you wouldn't know that any destruction had happened. Fortunately, Hawaii has a climate where things regrow very quickly. But the point is that humans are up for disaster. Humans can face disaster. We do know what to do when things like that happen, and we will very quickly self-organize ourselves. That doesn't mean that there isn't going to be massive loss of life for the simple reason that we're not being proactive. We know these disasters are upon us, and still our governments are dragging their heels and not doing the things necessary fast enough. So we have to rely on the grassroots people much more than the governments. And the way to make yourself secure if you're afraid of what's happening is to roll up your sleeves and work on building a secure local economy where you are. If we all start working on our food supply, can we get a food supply going that doesn't have to be transported more than 50 or 100 miles rather than halfway around the globe? Can we work out transportation systems, use more bicycles that don't need power at all, develop local energy? We've now got windmills and solar available and geothermal and all these things that we can do, and not the least of which, it is still perfectly legal, at least in the United States, to develop your own community currency. So you can set up local credit unions, you can lend to each other to get new industries going, to uh, help farmers uh, who should be saving seeds now too, going back to organics so that we can save our best seeds as farmers did throughout history. Um, all of these ways of getting together, talking to each other in community and figuring out how do we make life work here where we are so that there will be less fewer refugees in the world in mass migrations trying to find places to live. And we should be educating the whole world to do this kind of grassroots development so that they won't have to come from one place to another to take what you've developed, which is then another fear that kicks in. I live on the island of Mallorca in Spain because I'm very interested in greening an economy that has really fallen apart through an addiction to mass tourism and went from uh, growing 90% of its food organically to importing 90% 90 of, 90 of its food, much of it not organic, and from producing 90% of its energy locally through windmills to importing 90% of that. And as we do that, people say, oh, well, but if we get things right here, then they'll all be coming up from North Africa because they'll be hungry there. And I say, well, that's a good point. Let's send some teams down to North Africa and teach them how to green deserts because that too is not difficult and not expensive. 
Uh, the giant corporations that have been seen as the main aspect of globalization may not be functioning in the future, so we may have to rely on more local economic production. It's impossible to predict exactly what will happen when sea levels rise, when uh, fossil fuels run out. Those questions should be very much on our minds, and some countries are taking initiatives the latest initiative was uh, taken in Brazil. I was there a few weeks ago, and uh, a lot of Brazil is now opting for an 80% reduction in carbon emissions in only 10 years. It's called the 80-20-20 initiative. And the main media company of Brazil got totally behind this campaign. And for that reason, everybody is seeing it with their breakfast news, and is being told how to change personal lifestyles as well as building local community uh, to take care of itself and reduce the carbon emissions of industry, of cars, of whatever is producing it. My biggest puzzlement as an evolution biologist is why is the one species that has a brain that can be proactive, that has already announced its own unsustainability on the planet, is aware of all the crisis, not doing more about it? And I can only say it's the habit of the old story. Uh, the old story that it's human nature to compete with each other, and also the uh, calling our systems democratic without taking the responsibilities of a democracy, of uh, casting our votes and then permitting leaders to do things that we wouldn't want them to do. So we're not well educated in the West compared to some other parts of the world. You know, one of the poorest states in India uh, has a higher literacy rate than the United States does and knows more history and things like that. So I think our education system has declined because we've chosen to use the resources. When I say our, I'm speaking now as an American. I'm also a Greek citizen and, and have a perspective from that side. And I live in Spain and, and I've lived in Peru and and traveled the world and still travel the world all the time. So I try to have global eyes. And uh, recently in Malaysia was looking through what does the economy look like from their perspective? Why is the East booming while the West seems to be collapsing? These big issues. But we're not taught these things in school. So I believe that Western education has undereducated its youth and not motivated them to uh, feel competent in facing crises. You have to recognize crisis as the greatest opportunity in order to do well with it. And another little trick I have, I call it standing tall in your can canoe. Wait a minute. Another little trick I have, I call standing tall in your canoe. I learned from Pacific indigenous sailors that they had lots of ways to navigate without a compass, from cloud formations to fish patterns to seaweed floating to even when they couldn't see the stars. Uh, clouds forming over islands gave you a clue that they were there. Uh, the whole business of ocean currents. And when all else failed, they said, stand tall in your canoe until you can see the land. It's almost like you have to try all the other methods before you can cheat in this way. But they were aware that human consciousness has the wonderful property that you can take it up above yourself. You can, during a dull lecture, be having sex on a Hawaiian beach, you know? We know how to take our consciousness elsewhere. So you can rise above yourself and look down on the human drama as if it's playing out on a stage. Here are the crises, here are the villains, here are the good guys, here's what's happening. And then you can sort of calm yourself and say, okay, this is a play that I'm in and I have the ability to take the responsibility for my own role, even to choose my own role to a certain extent. And then you can come back down into it, having breathed, having calmed yourself and say, where can I move this thing ahead without beating my head against a wall or crawling into a hole in fear? 
There are a lot of things we can learn from indigenous people who stayed so embedded in natural ecosystems that they learned a lot from them. And often they were in places like rainforests where uh, the highly cooperative systems were in place. And they would gently rearrange their ecosystems, perhaps by spitting seeds along the path that they uh, hunted along, and then uh, the crops that they wanted to eat would be readily available on the paths through the rainforest. And But uh, in the mountain agriculture, for instance, in the Peruvian and Bolivian Andes, was the most sophisticated agriculture in the history of the whole world. It's why I went to live there, to study it. They were growing uh, sensitive plants like lettuces at 15, 16,000 feet altitude by using a ditch and table agriculture that just uh, dug ditches between uh, banks of earth where they could punch holes in the banks and put the seeds in, and then the roots would in the ditches be able to get water. So they would flood this whole Chinampa system, as they called it, from Lake Titicaca um, by opening sluice gates once a year. And the water would keep the fields from freezing and the fish would come in with the water so that the roots were getting very nourishing um, water and uh, the plants grew very well there. And the uh, Andean agriculture is responsible for half the food eaten in the world today. It's amazing because all the corn, or maize as it's called in Europe, um, and all the amaranth grains, very popular in China and very high protein, like quinoa is the one that we have learned through astronauts using it, and um, uh, all the eggplants and peppers and tomatoes and the potatoes, another huge staple crop by now around the world, were all developed there in the Andes with uh, this amazing seed banks and the Inca Empire trying out in the Sacred Valley uh, the mini climates and how things grew and which seeds should go to which part of the empire and so forth. So the agricultural science, extremely sophisticated. The medical sciences, uh, the herbal knowledge of the Amazon, um, so many things. And then a lot of the social science of, say, the Haudenosaunee, whom the white man called the Iroquois, from whom we got the United States Constitution through Ben Franklin's uh, friendship with the Indians. And they had a, a great law of peace that had kept peace for a thousand years and an amazing gender balance, and perhaps the best way of choosing leadership I've ever seen, because uh, when the U.S. Constitution adopted it, they didn't adopt their way of electing leaders. They put in votes, which no indigenous culture ever uses voting to elect leaders, none that I've ever heard of. And the way they did choose them was the grandmothers chose the chiefs because they had watched the boys grow up. They knew who would serve society well, and they had the power behind the throne, so to speak, that if they were not serving their people well, after one warning, the grandmother's council could remove them from office. So the grandmothers didn't need to be in public and, and uh, you know, be the politicians, but they had this choosing right. And I think that's an amazing way to do it because of the lack of vested interest that they would have. They wanted their society to work well. You know, economies used to be run to feed everybody and give the children a safe place to sleep, basically. And uh, somehow, uh, men have taken economics into a global casino gambling game that just should never, ever have happened, but it did. And uh, it's a phase in our juvenile stage of evolution, and now we have to get beyond it and recreate economies that really are for the well-being of all the people of Earth. And it can be done. You know, it's impossible to do science without having a worldview. You can't study nature, and that's the basic task of science, is to study the natural world and ourselves in it and uh, come up with some kind of a, an orderly framework or picture of who we are, how we got here, what we're doing, and where we may be going. 
And so the worldview of science is based on what are technically known as fundamental assumptions about the universe. Any science has to have some fundamental assumptions about what kind of a universe we live in and how it can be studied. So Western science had as its basic notion that we live in a non-living universe and that this non-living universe is purely material, came about by accident, by series of accidents, and um, can be studied objectively without interfering in it. It's separate from us in some sense. Now, it's interesting that Erwin Schrödinger, the world-class physicist, wrote in the 40s and 50s already that it was very strange that we built this model of the universe in the human mind, in consciousness, within consciousness, and then left that consciousness out of the model. <laughs> but so be it. Western science came up with a story that was half from physics saying... The world began, the universe began with a big bang, and ever since then it's been running down by entropy. Its energy, like that of a battery, is dissipating. And then biology, and of course that universe has no meaning or a purpose because it is not created, it is an accidental series of events. Let me start the whole thing over because it's not tight. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. okay. The basic worldview of Western science can be seen as half physics and half biology. The physics part of it is that the world begins with a big bang and it's running down ever since, just like a battery does. And we call that running down entropy. This universe is meaningless and purposeless. It has only come about by accident and it's a material, energetic universe. Then biology comes along with the Darwinian hypothesis saying life is neg entropy, basically that's what it's called in science, which means it's going in the opposite direction. It's increasing organization rather than falling apart, right? And it's competing for scarce resources in this uphill battle against the downhill slide of entropy. Now that's the most depressing worldview I have ever encountered in any indigenous or other society in human history. Because it's saying we're stuck in a meaningless universe that's running downhill and even life is deteriorating in the end, is doomed. So it's not a surprise that we built a consumer society to comfort ourselves. First, the competition, uh, the, the wonderful alliance between the young industrial entrepreneurs of Europe and science, which had been rejected by the church but was useful to the businessmen because of the inventions that it made possible. So the older rule of church and state gave way to this new rule of industrial entrepreneurs and scientists. And they became so powerful together with the Enlightenment, of course, which played its role in ideas of democracy, that the secular nation-state came of this alliance. And in the secular nation-state, it's science that tells the creation story rather than the church. So uh, the scientific story that we are part of a meaningless, purposeless universe running down by entropy in a losing battle of life, trying to get uphill against this stream of decay, is what we're living by up until now. Now, many Western science scientists, such as myself, changed our fundamental assumptions. You have to have a set of uh, assumptions about the universe in order to build theories and test them. So we changed our assumptions basically to those that came out of ancient India, the Vedic notions, the idea that there's a uniform field of cosmic consciousness within which matter arises as a living universe. So we went 180 degrees opposite the original assumptions of a non-living universe to posit a living universe. Within that living universe, we see ourselves embedded, our consciousness being a small portion of the total of cosmic consciousness, 
not a possibility for purely objective study because we know, and even physics discovered this, and half the physicists know that consciousness actually collapses wave functions, you know, makes the reality happen depending on what you're observing. So we have a very different picture. And what I'm doing now is encouraging other sciences to that have existed in the world. For instance, Arabic science provided a foundation for both Western science and for Islamic science. And Islamic science has been snowed under by Western science because of its hegemony. And Western science has stated, science is science, there can be no other science. Now, the religions may say, my religion is the correct one and everybody should believe in it, but it acknowledges the existence of other religions, whereas science doesn't. And I think it's dangerous to have a single monopoly science that has a particular worldview at its very foundation that may not hold very well given our new knowledge coming out of that very same science through physics. Finding out that the world of matter dissolves into pure energy uh, at its foundation and that that energy seems somehow very related to consciousness. And uh, so we need a new foundation, but I don't want to stay in the juvenile mode of conquest that sees the new assumptions replacing the old ones. I want to say, look at what Western science is good at. It has spawned the most wonderful technologies from spaceships down to uh, mini, mini microscopes and nano machines and things that much of which is very useful. The whole communications ability of the internet depends on the technology coming out of Western science, much medical equipment, things like that. However, because Western science has always taken a mechanical uh, model for nature, always sees the heart as a pump and the brain as a computer and the genome as little nanomachinery now, it does not understand how life actually works from a perspective that says life is intelligent at that level. And so we need the two sciences in parallel if we have a living universe science and a non-living universe science. And Islamic science gets up and says, we want to do a true science of economics because economics has always been based on looking at human social behavior, industry, profit-making systems, and it has not looked at nature for its clues to how does a highly evolved living system economy works. That's what I would call a true science of economics. Hmm. What would you say? By the way, the Nobel Prize is not a Nobel Prize in economics. It's a Swedish bank prize. I don't know if anyone has mentioned that. But the Swedish bank gives a prize to an economist or a team of them every year on the day of the Nobel Prizes, and the whole world is led to believe, and even many newspapers will call it the Nobel Prize in economics. It is not there, and people in the Nobel family are trying to get rid of it because of the misrepresentation. Anyway, the, the point I'm trying to make is that we should then uh, let India revive its science because for thousands of years it studied human consciousness so well, and we need that kind of science. And maybe young people in the future will be talking to aliens and getting a very different take on the universe and wanting to write their own assumptions for doing science in that kind of universe. So if we could agree to a cooperative, a consortium of sciences in dialogue with each other, then where Western science goes astray by messing in the food supply through high-tech agriculture, which is very bad for the earth and for the food, through genetic engineering, which they don't understand well, and no food genetically engineered has been proven to be better for people yet, uh, and yet it's a multi-billion dollar industry. You need a counter to that. You need a science that can stand up and say, look, here's why you shouldn't be doing that. Stick to technology in your other domains where you're good at it and don't do damage. In a really highly developed economy, I believe the role of money will be the role of that currency called adenosine triphosphate in your own body. 
in your cells where the money is issued in order to make the transactions happen and is never repaid. It's issued over and over depending on how much you need, but it's a disappearing currency. It works to make a transaction happen and then it's not there anymore. So basically, the highest evolution of the economy would have that kind of a gifted currency, a gifted currency, not even an equal value exchange barter currency, which I see as a step from interest debt money to barter currency to gifting currency. That's the sequence that I see in the maturation of economies. We are so smack in the middle of this transition from the youthful phase to the mature phase, meaning urbanized humanity, our global economy, is very adolescent right now. And as we all know, adolescents are a mass of contradictions. One minute they're feisty and competitive and wanting to strike out on their own and knowing it all and and battling hard on the sports field and stuff. And the next minute they've become very sweet and gentle, wonderfully uh, mature, cooperative people, right? So this is what we're seeing in the world today. We're seeing all the, and in fact, the adolescents on the internet are very into gifting. You see, they have gotten this. Why should we pay for our music? Why should we pay for our movies? Uh, we want to give to each other freely. They're, in, they're, they're carrying this new genome for that kind of mature economy, but it's very difficult to do it in an economy that's still based on uh, debt money and the accumulation of money and things like that. So the fact that many places in the world are developing local uh, credit unions, local currencies and stuff is one of the very hopeful signs. So that what we need is to develop them enough so that people have a real cushion when the big system collapses. It seems likely that that uh, debt money system will go on for a while, even if the whole Western economy and its banking system failed, the Eastern economies probably will adopt the same kind of debt money system for a while. And it depends on how fast these, the new generation gets it they're educating themselves. There are wonderfully instructive materials available now on the internet. And I hope this film will be part of that process of getting people to get that there are different ways of doing things and that there is nothing to stop us. My favorite Rumi poem ends with the line, why do you stay in prison when the door is so wide open? And by the way, uh, my favorite Hafiz poem is about the economics of nature. And it goes, Never once in all this time has the sun said to the earth, Earth, you owe me. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights up the whole sky. Isn't that beautiful? That's the sun gifting. Gifting to the earth and making it flourish for five billion years through endless crises, through crises that wiped out 95% of the life forms. And then after each crisis, suddenly a fluorescence of new life forms, not as slow Darwinian lineages branching gradually, but as whole ecosystems recreating themselves from their common DNA pool. You see, I don't know why biologists don't get this living earth, <laughs> which is just as alive as the universe. Um, and more so uh, because the DNA pool is common to everything from the first bacterium to the tallest tree, the biggest mammoth, all of it. And it changes, exchanges DNA freely all the time. You're breathing in my DNA right now and I yours. You know, we have DNA available if our genomes want new genes, you know, they can catch them out of the atmosphere. <laughs> We're living in a huge choice point, a choice point where people either crawl into a hole, pick up a gun, or roll up their sleeves and say, hey, let's build the world that we want, right? We all would like to see a cooperative world and we can start it locally in our communities. That's why I love Hazel Henderson's 
think globally, act locally. Uh, in Mallorca here, we're saying think globally, eat locally in order to promote more local organic agriculture. Oh, I love saying to young people, you know, you can invent any technologies you want in the future because they're not all going to become organic farmers, right? They're going to, there's a lot of techies out there. I said, there are only two rules you have to follow. Make, don't put any toxins in it and make it 100% recyclable. And then from there, you're free to do it any way you want. It's an exciting world. It's a world where people really are taking on this responsibility of citizenship taking the initiatives and just plain doing things without waiting for some government, pleading with them, trying to get some organization, trying to get funded. I'll tell you another great story that was one of the most inspirational um, experiences of my life. I was in China in 1974, taken to a place called Red Flag Canal, where young people had just built a, a staggeringly phenomenal irrigation system bringing water from a river 60 to 70 kilometers across a mountain range from the desert valley in which they lived, where there were several hundred towns dying of thirst, of starvation, old people drinking kerosene so they wouldn't use up another drop of water. And they were forbidden to do this project when the government learned of it, and yet, as soon as the government agents went away, they started to smelt iron from the dry red earth of their valley floor in mud oven, or, you know, they built their own ovens, and made pickaxes, shovels, um, hammers, and chisels out of it, made homemade rope, swung from the cliffs of a barren mountainside that I saw with my own eyes to dig the first toeholds into this mountain. I interviewed the Iron Girls dynamite team who with homemade dynamite blasted tunnels through the mountains. The men were building aqueducts from stones that all the villagers down below were hammer and chiseling into blocks and ants in a row carrying it up into the mountain camps. And this, this amazing thing with aqueducts bigger than what the ancient Romans built and tunnels through the mountains happened. The water came down. They sent someone to a county school to learn how to make generators, and every time the water fell three feet, uh, they put a generator on it, and the whole place now is green. You can see it on the internet. It's become a major tourist site in China, and they did it purely out of motivation and sweat equity. That nowadays, the Chinese students have completely shifted into the capitalist feeding frenzy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think China's lost a lot of good practices from back then. Because mm -hmm. they, the, they got so much done through motivation, and they didn't allow any foreign investment. Mm -hmm. And that's why they built a, an economy so strong that they could call the shots, buy half America, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and now they're buying up half of Africa and South America and stuff because they had no debts. They had no debts. They knew that economies are made by people's labor, not by investments of cash, of money, right? It's a completely different attitude toward building an economy that they had up until quite recently. And then they jumped on the bandwagon big time and let their peasants get screwed again. And now they're facing revolutions from within and, you know, we'll see how how this works. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the United States government had the constitutional right, of course, to create its own money. And it let that go in 1913 when it gave that power to Congress, to which gave it away to, I mean, Congress had the power, and then Congress gave it away to private bankers. And I don't know if you know the story of that, but there's a huge book called The Creature from Jekyll Island, Kind of about guess. yeah okay it's, it's taunting me yeah. <laughs> right so uh, I think it would the most wonderful thing that could happen in the United States is to reclaim the government's right to coin its own money I mean how ridiculous is it for the government to borrow money from private banks and then to have to pay it back with interest and to have the whole debt now on the taxpayer when they could have created that money themselves in the first place. The banks made it out of nothing, and so could the government, right? <laughs> For the price of the printing press, electricity, and paper. 
So, uh, but the other things that have to happen too are campaign finance reform, so that there is no private investment in the public choice of leadership. And then we have to get rid of the lobbying system in Washington. So, uh, because again, that's about private vested interests with a lot of money swaying the votes. And just as the world economy was pretty badly wrecked by forcing countries to take huge loans that they couldn't repay in turn for, you know, slave labor and cannon fodder and votes at the UN, as John Perkins revealed so well in his book. I would, I would uh, trace back the financial system to the influx of gold and silver from the New World, um, when, when that stolen gold and silver was brought to Europe, it was a huge influx of money because they melted down all those silver and gold objects and turned them into bullion. And that meant that suddenly there was this large amount of money that could be used for some purpose. And it financed the Industrial Revolution, the stolen money taken from the indigenous people of the Americas. Um, or for them, it wasn't money. For them, it was sacred objects. But we all know the story of uh, um, Atahualpa and the two rooms full of solid gold and silver objects that he uh, paid for his ransom, and then they garroted him anyway and things like that. But the, um, so the Industrial Revolution began this major financing activity. And the bankers, you know, recognized the possibilities and then invented fractional reserve banking and all the things that led to this being a casino. If we reclaim the government's right to issue money, I don't think that would a bad, be a bad thing, but I think it would be good to have it concurrent with local currencies. You know, so that, and then you'd have to figure out the taxation system. Now, in the Constitution of the United States, taxes are supposed to come from land use so that industries and property owners would pay taxes on land and production taxes paid by the companies rather than sticking the tax onto the price of the goods that they sell and then having the consumer have to give it back again. You see, that's a very inefficient system. So why not do the taxation at the point of production and at the ownership of land end, and then you don't need a private income tax? That was never intended by the Founding Fathers. And it just seems really completely inefficient to me to, to pay people uh, money that you then ask them to give back. But uh, preferably, I'd like to go to the body bankers, you know, system of, of just using, using uh, I don't like to call it plastic, <laughs> but you know, plastic is something that, well, plastic really needs to be recycled, and we, maybe we could recycle it into these stored value credit cards that are given freely. You know, it's an interesting task for young people to work out how would a really healthy economy work? Now, one of the things I thought up long ago was that um, you should, when, once you have an internet, and they didn't, at the, we didn't yet at the time I thought this up, but now that it's so easy for us to collect and process information, we can literally ask people what they want their culture to produce. How much milk do they want produced? How many people want to drink milk and in what quantities? How many people want to eat corn and in what quantities? You know, that kind of question. And then you say, okay, here's how the economy works. You feed back to them. Here are the jobs available. Uh, what kind of health care do we want? How many doctors will it take? All that. And then say, okay, who wants to be a doctor? Who wants to be a lawyer? Who wants to be a, a farmer to milk cows? And we're going to milk them organically at 4 a.m. in the morning. We're not going to use machinery because it's not good for cows. Okay. And you find out that more people sign up to be doctors or lawyers than sign up to be farmers because they don't like the work. So you simply say, okay, farmers only have to work three days a week. Now how many pe And doctors have to work five days a week. Now how many people sign up? Whoops. The numbers start shifting. 
ooh, I get four days a week free, you know, free time to be a poet or a healer or whatever I want to do, I'll, I'll volunteer for that. There's no reason why the farmers can't be shuffled, why the same farmer doesn't have to milk the cow every morning seven days a week. So you adjust with time, with the amount of time required for the job, rather than with income, and therefore you can have a, a more level income in a way. Um, the Mondragon cooperatives in Spain have a rule that the highest paid person in the culture cannot make more than six times the lowest. And that means that if you want your top guy to earn 300,000 uh, euros a year, then the janitor has to get 50,000, whoever is the, the lowest paid. And that seems to work quite well for them. They have a distribution of income, but nothing like the thousands of times more, you know, that we have in the world economy today. So another interesting thing about the Mondragon cooperatives in Spain were that when the um, priest in this Basque country culture decided 40 years ago to try a new kind of, of community-owned economy, he said, I don't want it to be capitalist, and I don't want it to be communist or even socialist. I want this to be an economy based on human relationships and loving human relationships at that. So he went around to all the bars and places that young people hung out, and he said, if you wanted to build an economy based on loving relationship, how would you do it? And he got lots of input from people on how it might be done, and then they did it. And they set up a workers' cooperative industry to make household appliances, a very, you know, a significantly large industry, even though it was small. Um, and it's still very competitive on the European market. They may, and now it's grown by leaps and bounds to be making uh, construction work like bridges, to be building buses, things like that. And they've spun off a couple hundred smaller um, economy organizations, businesses, and also the Orozki supermarkets of Spain come from there. Orozki is a, ba a Basque word. And um, this, this works quite well. And now when a farmer, when a, a worker came into this economy, he didn't have money to invest in the economy. So how was he going to be an owner? What they did was instead of uh, taxing, they taxed his income into a fund that built up his equity to a certain level. And everybody, no matter at what level they were in the company, had the same ownership. So it's equal ownership by all the people in it. And last year when they had to lay off 10% of their workforce, um, they decided to do it by lottery. And by the way, people rotate through jobs. No one gets to be a manager if he hasn't been in low-level jobs in the company. So they decided to do the layoff by lottery to give people 80% of their wages and to retrain them for nothing for other jobs if they wanted to. And if they have to do it a second year, that wave of people will go back to work and a different set will be chosen by lottery. So they're very conscious of keeping their community strong and keeping everybody's income up and things like that. And it works, it works, it works. And that's why the body economy model is, is helpful to see that no one organ can exploit the others, no one organ can hoard blood and deprive others of the blood, uh, that this just doesn't work in a living system. But because our economics have come from the Western scientific models of machinery for nature, we've always tried to see the economy as a well-oiled machine that runs smoothly. And the whole Cold War was a contest between does the capitalist West or the communist East have the perfect social machinery, both of them basing it on heavy industry and exploitation of resources in the third world. And, you know, the same principles were operating. Um, and that's not what we need. We don't want economies in which the, the products, the stuff, are what's important. We want economies in which the human relations are important. How are we all living? Are we all doing well? The way any indigenous grandma would, uh, you know, run the economy and choose the appropriate chiefs to run it. 